you would please stand to your feet, grab your Bibles, and turn them to Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. I'm going to ask that you stand for the reading of God's word today. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. We're going to go a little Old Testament today. According to the leading of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Verse 1 says this, Stand up, son of man, said the voice. I want to speak with you. The Spirit came into me as he spoke, and he said to me on my feet. He set me on my feet, and I listened carefully to his word. Son of man, he said, I am sending you to the nation of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. They are stubborn and hard-hearted people. But I am sending you to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or refuse to listen, for remember they are rebels, at least they will know they have a prophet among them. I want to take for emphasis verse number five. And whether they listen or refuse to listen, for remember they are rebels, at least they will know they have a prophet among them. This is the word of the Lord and the church said, amen. I want to preach today from the topic, when preaching is unpopular. When preaching is unpopular, you may be seated. Holy Spirit, we ask for your guidance through this moment, but also through this culture and this society. We ask you, Father, to fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit, that we would be like the sons of Issachar, understanding the times and knowing what to do. Lord, there is a demand that you're putting on the heart of your people in this hour. We cannot passively just float through life without hearing your voice and being obedient to your word. So I pray, Father, that you would fill me right now with your Holy Spirit to speak to your people. I am but a vessel. The excellency of the treasure is in the vessel. Vessel is not the main attraction. It's the treasure that's been placed within the vessel. And so as I deliver this treasure, Lord, let people not see me, but let them see you. And Father, I pray that people will walk out of here encouraged in what they believe about you not intimidated by the society and the culture that we live in, but so enamored, so in love with you and your word that they'll say whatever you've led them to say and allow you to fight their battles for them. Use this moment for your glory, for this church and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We live in a society that is obsessed with popularity. Let me say that again. We live in a society that is obsessed with popularity. The word popular means to be liked, admired, or enjoyed by many people. And at the earliest stages of human development, we see the inherent desire to be liked. Infants crave and demand the undivided attention of their parents. Infants have an ability to attract attention. That's why some of y'all struggle doing the service because you're looking at the baby. And the baby, although they have not fully been actualized in terms of their personality and their ability to discern right from wrong, they enjoy the attention because they are wired that way as little people to crave attention from others. In elementary school, nobody wants to sit at the lunch table by themselves There is an inherent instinct to gather and to cluster together and to be with friends and to be with other people that you like, to like and to be liked. By the time girls are in middle school, they are gossiping about who's the most popular boy or girl in the school. By the time you get to high school, student body presidents and homecoming kings are determined by popular vote. And popularity is not just the infatuation of youth, the world of business, politics, and media are dominated by the pressures of popularity. Corporations invest millions 
of dollars to become the most popular brand on the shelf. Public opinion polls speculate how popular or unpopular a sitting president is, and television shows are funded based on how high their ratings are. We live in a time that is dominated by the concept of market research. Market research is the discipline that blends consumer behavior and economic trends to help businesses identify their customers. Market research helps us to study consumer behavior, and in order for us to be popular, we research what people are doing in the marketplace, and then we align our brand and our product to where the consumer trends are. And in the world of big data, social media understands and plays on our craving for popularity. And by creating addictive platforms driven by likes and positive feedback, they keep us at the table of their feed. It's called a feed for a reason. It's called a feed for a reason. <laughs> uh, we don't spend a lot of time out on the farm. But when you have livestock, there's a trough. And they put feed in the trough to gather the attention and to feed the cattle. And, and so many people's heads are stuck in the trough of multimedia, the trough of social media, constantly feeding the infinite scroll, the, the, the allure of more information or, 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 or more content has drawn people to a place where they are constantly consuming content, and now they've convinced you not only to be a consumer of a content, but to produce content. You can go live, you can post a selfie or a moment, and all of this is part of a platform and big data and algorithms that are designed to push you advertisements and promotions. Neuroscientists have found that someone liking your Instagram post triggers the same type of chemical reaction that is caused by gambling and recreational drugs. When someone likes our post, you got to understand the psychology behind it, the very liking of the post creates a chemical response in us because everybody wants to be well liked. And when someone likes the post, it triggers chemicals in our body that make us feel a certain type of way that makes us want to post some more and makes us want to get more likes. And as we get more likes and as we post more things, we spend more time on the platform. The more time we spend on the platform, the more advertisers grok, they flock to the platform, the more and the more and the more. And it all feeds this economy that preys on our instinct and desire to be popular. According to an article by Harvard University, Researcher Trevor Haynes, when you get a social media notification, your brain sends a chemical messenger called dopamine along a reward pathway, and it makes you feel good. Dopamine is associated with food, exercise, love, sex, gambling, drugs, and now social media. So here it is. To boost self-esteem and a sense of belonging, people often post things hoping to receive positive feedback. And the likes and the positive feedback can release dopamine, a feel-good chemical. But the problem is that the high of being liked can be addictive. The high of being liked can be addictive. That feeling, that notification, that ping that somebody's watching, that ping that somebody's listening, that feeling that someone is giving their attention to you can become psychologically addicting because of the dopamine hit that you receive when it happens. And when it becomes addictive, it's not just us doing it. We need to understand the drivers at work that cause us to do it again and again and again. And the problem with addiction is that with addiction comes the temporary high, but then there are all the side effects of addiction, which now we're finding that social media is now associated with anxiety, depression, and even physical ailments. You gotta hear what I'm saying. People are getting physically sick 
due to this drive of dopamine and likes and did people see it and do people hear me or do people respond and it's literally affecting people's bodies with physical ailments, not to mention all of the mental difficulties that people are feeling and facing because of this confusing world that has now been encapsulated with a feed that's drawn all of our attention. Why am I dealing with this? Because I believe that if we as the church, the people of God, are going to march forward with a clear heart and a clear conscience, that we at some point have to acknowledge the feedback leap loop of dopamine and we have to deal with it at the root because you can't do what God has called you to do and be driven and addicted to the dopamine of people liking you. You, you have to be careful as you aim to be a believer in Christ that you are not so driven by the opinions of people that you fail to do what God has called you to do, to say what God has called you to say, to live how God has called you to live. And you got to take a moment to step back and to see the culture and the society for what it is. How many people are stuck because of popularity and wanting to be liked? Stuck between was very clearly God's will and the potential backlash of doing what God said. Stuck between what they were taught to be true from their youth and the pattern of this world, which is so persuasive, so sensual, so alluring, and people are stuck. But if we're going to be effective in this culture, we've got to get unstuck and we've got to recognize the world for what it is. Now, for better or worse, social media has shifted economies, provided new ways for people to get paid. Over the past decade, we've seen the rise of the social media influencer. The social media influencer. Back in the day, you'd ask dudes, what do you want to be? I want to be a rapper. I want to be an athlete. But now, people say, I want to be an influencer. I want to be an influencer. Here's the definition of a social media influencer. It is a person with a large social media following that can impact, that can sway, that can shape the behavior and opinion of their followers. By definition, an influencer is a person with a large social media following that can impact, that can sway, that can shape the behavior and the opinion of their followers. An influencer shapes opinion. An influencer develops a following, subscribers, likes, followers, with the intent of creating content that draws people in for the purpose of impacting, swaying, and shaping their behavior. Influencers create content regularly on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook with the intent of growing their fan base. If you are an influencer, your first job is to grow your fan base. It's to get more and more people to like you, to follow you. Then the next goal of the influencer is to monetize that following through advertisement, sponsorship, and brand placement. I'm sharing this with you because I want you to understand the technical definition, and, and it can be neutral. It can be used in a positive way, but I want you to see the trends of the culture. So I don't want you walking out saying that Pastor Dexter said that social media is all bad. I need to get off that, that I just, you know, no, 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 no. I need you to hear what the spirit is saying and be discerning as you navigate this culture and this society and not keep your head in the sand, but see what's going on at greater trends. If you're going to be like the sons of Issachar, you got to understand the times and know what to do. you got to take a step back and see the bigger picture. Listen to me. Even in Christianity, we have seen the emergence of the Christian influencer. From entertaining TikTok videos to YouTube podcasts, Christian influencers have become an industry unto themselves. Listen to me. Popularity pays. When you've developed a following and you go live on YouTube and people subscribe, the amount of time and the amount of followers you have 
does something to the algorithm that allows you to get paid for your influence. That is the purpose of being, technically speaking, a Christian influencer, a social media influencer. It is an economic model, a revenue model. Now, we all have influence. We had influence before there was social media. Okay, so we're not negating the power of influence. And yes, there are times where you can have a following and you just simply have influence because you have a following. But this is what I need you to see. I need you to see the trends of where the world is going. This idea of an influencer and now the multi-platform, multi-channel influencer. I have my YouTube. I have my TikTok. I have my Facebook. I have my books. I have my products. I have this. I have that. You have to be careful that even the voices that are influencing you on social media, that they are biblically sound and grounded in Christ. And what's going to continue to happen is that because people, watch this, will build platforms that are seemingly bigger and greater than the church. In a world driven by popularity, Folks will follow after teachers with itching ears because of the amount of followers they have, not because of the doctrine that is true and verified that they should be preaching. And what's going to happen as this culture continues and progresses and as postmodernism aims to deconstruct everything and as people hop up and say they're leaving the church and I'm leaving Christianity, this, what we're doing right now, is going to become less and less appealing to the public. And in exchange for the traditional church, there are people who want the same things, watch this, that they could get from the local church. They now feel like I can get that from online, from my favorite influencer, log into YouTube, get this and that, and I don't need community, I don't need accountability, I just need someone that's going to give me what I think I need. But here's the problem, not everything that is popular is appropriate. Not everything that's popular is appropriate. How many of you had a parent that used to say stuff like, well, if everybody going to jump off the bridge, you're going to do it too? <laughs> if I know what I'm talking about. That was such a crazy illustration because I was always thinking, well, we don't even live close to a bridge. Why would people jump off the bridge? I mean, you know, that's how I was thinking. But our parents were trying to prove a point that if everyone is doing something that's harmful and destructive, if you are only driven by groupthink, if you are only driven by popularity and what's popular, even if it's wrong, if you're doing it to fit in with the crowd and peer pressure, that peer pressure will drive you to do things that don't make sense if you're not careful. So our parents were trying to instill with us the ability to have discernment. The ability to discern people and relationships and to know that birds of a feather flock together. To understand that everyone that's in your inner circle doesn't have good intentions for you. To understand that everything that your little friends do is not necessarily what you do. How many of you had a parent that would very quickly distinguish them between your little friends? They would say things like, now I need you to understand I'm not one of your little friends. That might be how Johnny does it. That might be how Susie and her parents do it. But as for me and my house, this is how we're going to do it. As long as you're under my roof, this is, this is, they got that Montel Jordan. This is how we do it. Why is that important? Because the enemy is a deceiver and he plays on the gullibility of people. The naivete of people. Uh, the naivete of a Pinocchio will take you places that you didn't sign up for and get you into problems that you can't handle. And so more now than ever, the Christian believer needs discernment. Discernment. Test the spirit by the spirit. Discernment. Discernment rooted in the word of the Lord. Discernment. Discernment rooted in understanding basic theology. The gospel of Jesus Christ, systematic theology from Genesis to Revelation. You have to be rooted and grounded. You have to understand the real thing in a world filled with counterfeits. Just because it's popular doesn't make it appropriate. Just because it's viral doesn't mean that it's verifiable. And now people will condense ideas, thoughts, statements, and 15 second reels and it's catchy and it's entertaining but can it be verified by scripture who taught you that and when your attention span 
is so short and you get used to only surviving on sound bites. Listen, when you are submitted to a local congregation, there's a head chef called a pastor. Watch this, and the pastor is not just preparing a meal. The pastor has a God-inspired menu to provide you week after week. And that menu is designed to make sure that you get just enough of your protein, just enough of your greens and your nutritious stuff to give you just enough dessert to make sure that you have a full meal. But the pastor is looking at your entire diet and trying his or her best to feed you in such a way that helps you to grow as a sheep in God's pasture. He is the good shepherd, Jesus is, and the pastor is the under shepherd, and our responsibility is to feed the flock. Watch this, but our responsibility is also to protect the flock, which is why the shepherd has a staff to combat the wolves that come in with sheep's clothing, to combat the predators that seek to come in to snatch sheep out of the fold. And as I look at the culture and the society, there are people falling away from the faith. And they will not endure a full meal. Just give me a piece of that appetizer right there and I'm good. You cannot survive spiritually in this climate and this environment with appetizers only. Appetizers are delicious but fleeting. It's the reason why the appetizers are fried and provided to you in limited quality and quantity because you cannot be sustained on appetizers alone. But we live in a culture, a soundbite culture, a snack spiritually culture where people say, give me the appetizers and the dessert. Why? Because the food is hard to digest. So now we have to look, and everybody's a Christian influencer. Everybody's got an idea. Everybody's teaching and giving their ideas about God, and, and everybody's going live, and everybody's got a YouTube channel, and everybody's got a brand, and everybody's got something that they're selling, and something that they're selling, something. They're selling. So you got to ask yourself the question is this the anointing or the algorithm? This keeps showing up on my feet. Is that the anointing or the algorithm? Is this a move of the Holy Spirit, or are they just effective marketers? I told you a few weeks ago that just because there's repetition with something doesn't mean that it's confirmation, because the devil is persistent too. Some of us think, oh, I saw it three times. That means the Lord might be saying, no, 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 no. Just because you see it over and over and over again, it just might be effective advertising. Is it the anointing, or is it the algorithm? Is it preaching or product placement? You got to hear what I'm saying from the heart of a pastor. A preacher is called to be more than just a motivational mascot or a success coach. A preacher is called to be more than just a motivational mascot or a success coach. A preacher is commissioned to preach the word. And the danger is in a culture driven by popularity where the end game is influence, platforms, and followers, where we're now getting paid based on the amount of people who follow, like, and subscribe, that the message of the cross can be compromised. Because sometimes when you preach the cross, people will unfollow you. When you start preaching about sin, there's a place for motivation. You got to hear what I'm saying. But we don't ever talk about sin, repentance, we don't ever deal with the issues of society and culture in a way that's gospel-centric, where every message is about you living your best life, you becoming the best that you can be. I'm not your motivational mascot. Listen, if you embrace the word, yes, we see with Joshua, be strong and courageous you take the word and hide it in your heart, you will have great success. But the success that God gives is different than the success that the world promises. All that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 
So a preacher is called to be more than just a motivational mascot or a success coach. A preacher is commissioned to preach the word. 2 Timothy 4 and 2 says, preach the word. That word preach means to lift your voice and proclaim the word of God. The word communicates the will and the mind of God. Be ready in season and out of season. When you look at that word in the Greek, in season means in opportune seasons and out of season means in not opportune seasons. Watch this. In a marketing-driven world, you're always looking for the opportune season. Everything becomes a ploy and a strategy to capitalize on the market that you're trying to reach. But what about when the Lord gives you a word that's not within your marketing plan, not within your opportune season? Are you still going to release what the Lord said, even if it messes up the plans that you devise for yourself for success? We have to preach the word in season and out out of season. You have to preach the word when people love you, and you have to preach the word when people are looking crazy at you. You have to preach the word when people are saying, "Uh uh-huh, pastor, you talking to me. And you have to preach the word when people are tight-lipped looking at you crazy. Because y'all do look crazy sometimes. The Apostle Paul is saying, preach the word. In season and out of season. And then do three things. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. With all long-suffering, And teaching to convince it's tied to the world convict it means to reprimand or correct that the act of preaching is also the act at times of reprimand and correction to verbally say you're not doing what you're supposed to do and you got to correct and change course and get on the right path that is part of the act of preaching well preacher you're making me feel bad well you're doing wrong Welcome to the world of conviction. And in a morally depraved society where everybody's pursuing pleasure, above all, people don't like to be told that they're wrong because I can always spin my sin and call it something else and justify it and blame it on my trauma and blame it on what my daddy didn't give to me. Yes, those things happen, but that doesn't give you a license to do things against the word of the Lord and the very premise of the house of God and the word of God is that the word transforms us and helps us to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. So regardless of how we start it, The way we grow and mature is to allow the word to work on us. We don't come into the sanctuary and dissect the word. The word dissects us. We're on the surgery table. The scalpel is in the Lord's hand, and he will perform surgery on your heart by cutting you. So the goal is not to make you feel good every time we come together because sometimes we need to reflect. Sometimes we need to consider our ways. Sometimes we need to take a step back and look at how we're living and acknowledge that it's jacked up. So part of preaching is convincing and convicting to reprimand and correct. How many of y'all like to get reprimanded? Nobody raised their hand because nobody likes the feeling of correction coming to you because of your flesh. You feel a certain type of way. But, but, But when you submit to the process and when you reflect and when you're honest, when it's Holy Spirit led, you eventually, if your heart is right, come to the place of accepting the medicine, even though it's bitter when it goes down. And God is saying, I've scheduled your medicine, but you won't take it. That's the culture that we live in. Medicine is scheduled, but people won't take it. They will skip that medicine, and then they'll create their own remedy and say, no, I'm good. I'll take this. Baby, that ginger ale and saltine crackers ain't doing nothing. (laughs) Robitussin don't work for everything, despite what Chris Rock said. And spiritually speaking, some people are just taking ginger ale and saltine crackers for stuff. And God has said, no, you need some antibiotics. You need some Theraflu. Anybody ever drink Theraflu? No, I'm going to give you Alka-Seltzer. Watch this. No, no, no. I need to isolate you and put you on quarantine. I'm going to sit you down 
so that that, watch this, this virus that you got don't spread to other people. But in our flesh, the world says pleasure above all. So I feel, I don't feel, I don't feel good when someone corrects me. Therefore, it's not a safe space. So let me go somewhere. But they don't love you like that. And the culture doesn't understand this, that correction comes through love. That you can love someone and disagree with them. And the fact that you disagree doesn't mean that you don't love them. In fact, you love them enough to be truthful for them. See, the world can't handle this. If they really knew what this is, this community, according to Scripture, and what the Scripture teaches us, and what it means for us to really live what the text teaches, they wouldn't be, their minds will be blown at the ethics of the community of the body of Christ. But here's the problem. We don't even believe what's in the word. But if we learn how to live it and become a subculture in the midst of a dominant culture that's lost, people will be drawn not just by what we say, but how we live, because we'll actually be living according to the scriptures that we teach and preach and claim to be true. So conviction, convincing is a part of preaching the word. And then there's some times where there is rebuke. Rebuke is to warn forcefully, expressing strong disapproval. Sometimes correction can be very gentle. I, I remember as I was a basketball player, when I was young, I didn't really understand the game, and I used to shoot the ball with two hands. I used to just get the ball up any way I could and just shoot it with two hands when I was smaller. But then I had a basketball coach as I got older. He said, if you're going to go to the next level, you have to learn how to shoot with one hand. And so he would correct my form. I had developed a bad habit, but he would gently say, nope, get your arm in, get your arm in. It feels awkward, it feels uncomfortable, but as you get more repetitions, as you get more repetitions, you'll find a stroke and you'll begin to hit consistently with the right form. That's gentle correction. But then once I got to the college level, their correction wasn't always gentle. Anybody know what it's like to play Division I? Sports? They don't ask nicely all the time. We practice plays, and then we get out, and we have to execute them. And if we're not executing the play, the coach, by virtue of the moment that we're in, has to raise his voice and remind us of what the game plan was. And if you're going to be an athlete, you cannot be thin-skinned at that level. Because rebuke is part of the coach's toolkit. And so sometimes the pastor will raise his voice, raise her voice to warn, forcefully expressing strong disapproval. Listen, in my home, there's a wood stove. We turned that joker on yesterday because it was cold. And with that wood stove, you have to take wood and you put it in the wood stove and then you have to light it, then you have to monitor it, then you have to watch it. Then we put a gate in front of it because we have a toddler. And she needs to know that the stove is hot. And when she's getting ready to touch the stove, the only option is to raise our voice and to physically grab her because we don't want her to get hurt. There's a time to raise your voice. Warning. And so the preacher has to have dynamic. Sometimes I'll just talk to you. Sometimes we'll be conversational. I like the conversation. That's why I got the little headset and I can walk around with my hand in my pocket. Right? But, but, but then sometimes I have to stand flat-footed and raise my voice based on the intensity of what's going on in our society and our culture. To warn forcefully and express strong disapproval is to rebuke. And then there's exhortation. Exhortation is what we connect with encouragement to strongly encourage someone to action. But listen to me. There is godly exhortation and then there is demonic exhortation. Because exhortation pushes you to do something and what it should be pushing you to do is the will of the Lord. Not the will of your flesh. But in a popularity-driven culture, there is a tendency to give the people 
what they want. Because if I'm trying to protect my platform or my popularity, I have to give them what they want. But I keep on telling you the world doesn't love us. And you can walk in with pure intentions, just give them what they want, give them what they want, give them what they want, but they'll come back for the fishes and the loaves, not because Jesus is Lord. They'll come back because of what you can provide for them. And the moment, see, what you use to get people is what you have to continue to do to keep them. And so if you joined this church because of me-centered preaching, then I got to keep preaching to you as a me-centered preacher to keep you. But if you came because of the full counsel of the word of the Lord, then you realize the range and the dynamic of what it means to hear from God and to teach his word. So the Apostle Paul says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and teaching, long-suffering, patience. And so as we convince, as we rebuke, as we exhort, we do so with patience. We are patient with people. So you got to know that when I lift my voice, it's not because I'm angry. It's because there's an urgency in what God is saying. And he's saying, move, get in position. So I have to raise my voice, but it's done with patience and with teaching. I want you to understand while I'm raising my voice. And a good coach will yell at you in the game and then pull you to the sideline and say, this is what I was trying to communicate to you. This is, what I was, this is what I was trying to show you. This is how I was trying to get you to move. That is the role of a pastor and a preacher. Verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned away and aside to fables. They'll be turned to fables. They would rather hear a fairy tale than the truth. Pick which route you want to go. Create your own adventure. You want to search a specific topic? You can find no lack of influencers, authors, who can tell you what you think you need to hear. All I'm saying is be careful. Be careful because in this time, in this hour, there are folks who have itching ears and there are people who want to scratch the itch. Watch this, and if I can scratch the itch and get paid at the same time, sounds like a good hustle to me. The hustle mentality, when I say the hustle mentality, I'm not talking about hard work, I'm not talking about diligence, but the hustle mentality cannot be the modality of the people of God. Because the hustle mentality says, by any means possible, make it happen. But we have to factor in the will of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit. There are times where God will say, take a step back. Give this away for free. Help this person. It's not about the money. It's about this. It's about that. And if we are driven by hustle rather than the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be misled every single time. But the scripture says they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. All I'm saying is keep your eyes open, keep your head on the swivel, because the times that we live in are going to get progressively worse. Watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. The evangelist brings people back to the core message of the gospel. And what the world needs is the gospel. Although they reject it, it's what they need. They don't want to hear about Jesus, but that's what they need. What do I want to hear about Jesus? Oh, they'll take your pseudo-spirituality, they'll take your generic energy, your universe talk, but you start talking about Jesus, they now step into the realm of, oh, but that's how the world works. The world don't love you. You got to be watchful in all things. All I'm saying is, open your eyes, open your ears, let the Holy Spirit guide you through times like this. So here's the question for today. Here's what I'm getting to. What if God is leading you to share a message of truth that is not popular? Because this hits all of us squarely in our motivations and our intentions as people. I told you from the moment an infant is born, they crave attention. The elementary school student wants to know who's going to sit at the table with them. The middle school girls want to know who's the most popular. The high school folks want to win student council and homecoming king and queen. Corporations and businesses want to be on the top and they want to win. They want to ask you the question, 
What if God is leading you to share a message of truth that is not popular? Are you willing to sacrifice your popularity to be obedient to the word of the Lord? And no, you may not be a huge influencer. You may not have a platform or follower. You may not have an aspiration for ministry or business, but you have a life that you have to live and you have influence that God has given you. And every day there are moments where we are forced with whether or not we're going to compromise what the Lord is leading us to do or we're going to be faithful to what he said and what he's saying at the moment. And if you are driven by dopamine, if you are driven by the likes of people, if you are driven by pleasing people, then I'm gently rebuking, I'm gently convincing, I'm gently encouraging you, exhorting you to change your action and your behavior, to understand what's at stake and understand how the world works. What if God is leading you to share a message of truth that's not popular? That's the situation that the prophet Ezekiel found himself in. Now, during the time of Ezekiel, Israel was politically and spiritually bankrupt. Because of Israel's rebellion and idolatry, the Jews were exiled to captivity in Babylon. I told you a few weeks that Babylon was a historic city, but Babylon is also a biblical type and symbol. Babylon represents rebellion against God. Babylon represents world leaders who reject Christ, reject the Lord, and serve their own agendas. Babylon represents immorality and idolatry. And I told you a few weeks ago that the society that we're in has become a type of Babylon where people are forcefully rejecting the truth of God's word and doing what's right in their own eyes. And so here you have Ezekiel who's called to preach, called to be a prophet in the midst of Babylon. Ezekiel was assigned to these exiles. You know what the name Ezekiel means? Ezekiel means a man whom God has seized. A man whom God has seized. Are you a man whom God has seized? Ladies, are you a woman that God has seized? Are you a person that God has grabbed hold of? Because when God has you, you have really no choice but to do what he's calling you to do even when you personally don't like it. And when you read the narrative of Ezekiel, he has some questions. When you read the narrative of Ezekiel, he, he, he had some apprehensions. When you read the narrative of Ezekiel, he wasn't excited about this task that was given to him, but he was seized by God. It was like fire shut up in his bones. You keep growing in the word, keep growing and maturing in the faith, and you will understand what it means to be seized by God when you get to the point where you just got to say what you got to say. Keep living. Keep watching the culture spiral downward. Keep looking at people who are utterly lost because of false truths and pretense, and you'll feel like Ezekiel felt, seized by God. Ezekiel's prophetic career begins in Ezekiel chapter 1 with a magnificent vision and encounter with the Lord, y'all. He had a divine moment which involved a terrifying angelic visitation. Things that when you read it, it's, it's weird but glorious. That's what Ezekiel encountered, a verified encounter with the angels of God. And after experiencing the glory of the Lord, Ezekiel fell on his face and then he heard the voice of the Lord. Sometimes you cannot hear the voice of the Lord because it's been a while since you've experienced the glory of the Lord. When's the last time your face was to the carpet, overwhelmed by the power and the presence of the Lord? Is worship just a prerequisite in your Sunday checklist? Are you opening and availing yourself for God to speak to you, to overwhelm you with his presence and his glory? When's the last time we had a moment privately, not in front of other people where we're performing, but where the Lord just put us on our face, just put us on our back, just put us on the floor and overwhelmed us with his glory and his goodness. You can have a glory moment in your car. You can have a glory moment in your prayer closet. You can have a glory moment in your living room, in your office, but you have to desire the glory of God. People don't want the glory of God anymore. They want a production. They want a performance. They want their song, their favorite this and that. But are there any glory seekers? I need the presence. I need an encounter. I need him. That's what I need. 
doesn't matter what songs they sing on stage. I have the intention of meeting the Lord today. And it's when we submit to the presence and the power of the Lord that we invite the voice of the Lord to speak the strongest. Ezekiel had a divine encounter with the Lord. Then he heard the voice of the Lord. And this is what the Lord said. Ezekiel 2, verse 1. Stand up, son of man, said the voice. I want to speak with you. The spirit came into me as he spoke, and he set me on my feet. And I listened carefully to his words. Son of man, he said, I am sending you to the nation of Israel, a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been rebelling against me to this very day. Let me tell you what type of people they are, Ezekiel. They are a stubborn, hard-hearted people. But I am sending you to say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm sending you to a people. They're rebellious. Their ancestors are rebellious. They're stubborn. They are hard-hearted. But I'm giving you a message. I want you to point them to my sovereignty. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Now look at verse 5. And whether they listen or refuse to listen. Well, remember, I'm telling you in advance, they're rebels. I'm telling you in advance, the world's going to reject you. I'm telling you in advance, the people aren't going to accept everything that you have to say. I'm telling you in advance, I'm telling you in advance, I'm telling you in advance that when you find your voice in God, that there are going to be some people who reject you. I'm telling you in advance that everybody's not going to like what you have to say. I'm telling you in advance that you're going to lose some friends when you make a pivot and say, I'm going to live my life differently. I'm telling you in advance that some of your family members, they're not going to rock with you anymore. I'm telling you in advance that some people will not like what you have to say. But hey, whether they listen or refuse to listen, but remember, they are rebels. At least they will know that they have a prophet among them. In other words, Ezekiel, the message I'm giving you is not popular, but release it anyway. Welcome to the Prophetic 101. A true prophet says what the Lord leads him or her to say because it's what the Lord leads them to say. Too many popular prophets in today's culture. The Old Testament prophet, people weren't seeking a prophet. They were running away from him. Prophets show up in the town Who's in trouble? Who's messed up? Who's getting smoked? Who's getting destroyed? Who? Which king is tripping? Two sides of the coin of prophecy. There is foretelling and there is forthtelling. People today like the idea of forthtelling, foretelling, someone to tell you your future. Be careful because some people claim to be foretelling and they're really fortune telling. In the modern day prophet, people come in the cloak of Christianity, but they're just fortune tellers. To tell you what you want to hear for financial gain. The real prophets are forth tellers. They speak the mind of God concerning a matter, concerning a culture, concerning a society. And when God speaks his mind about what's going on in the world and the culture, most times he's addressing the issues and its ills. Where are the prophets who will speak up and to say what we're dealing with in today's society is crazy. We're the prophets that will stand up and say there's too much craziness going on even within the halls of the church. And we ought to repent and make sure we get back to the main thing. We're the people who have that prophetic edge. Not the people that are going to corner you and give you a personal prophecy so that they can have an undue in, uh, influence on your life. We're the people who are going to look out into the world and weep because they see how broken and fallen things are. And with tears in their eyes, say what they don't even want to say, but they know it's true. That's the type of prophet Ezekiel was. If you're really going to speak the mind of God, then you must divest yourself of your dopamine fix. If you're really going to represent God in this culture, you're going to have to open yourself up to the potential that everybody's not going to like you or receive what you have to say. But after all, we're not preaching for response. I heard the man of God teach me years ago. We're preaching for results. If you're truly going to speak the mind of God, you can't be driven by dopamine. If you're going to speak God's heart, you have to step outside of the positive feedback loop. 
you're going to speak the heart of God, you can't be afraid to lose some followers and some fans. Verse 6 says, Son of man, do not fear them or their words. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid, even though their threats surround you like nettles and briars and stinging scorpions. Do not be dismayed by their dark scowls, even though they are rebels. <laughs> that sounds like a hostile environment. Here you come, just trying to say what the Lord has led you to say. And people are threatening you, threatening to cancel you, threatening to drag you across the Internet. So I'm going to drag you from Twitter through Instagram and Facebook. Spirit of Jezebel making empty threats, but God is the one who sustains me. The weapons might be formed, but they shall not prosper. Nettles and briars and stinging scorpions. Don't be dismayed by the dark scowls, even though they are rebels. Uh, people sometimes can get a look on their face that will discourage you from saying what God has called you to say. But you're not moved by the looks on their face. You're moved by the truth that God placed in your belly to release. Verse 7 says, you must give them my messages whether they listen or not, but they won't listen for they are completely rebellious. Dang, God said it again. They're completely rebellious. He's reiterating their rebellion. But son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not join them in their rebellion. Open your mouth. Eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand reaching out to me. It held a scroll, which, was he, which, we, which he unrolled. And I saw that both sides were covered with funeral songs, words of sorrow and pronouncements of doom. And God says, here, Ezekiel, I want you to preach this. Why can't I preach on seven steps to success and manifestation? <laughs> My algorithm's going to be all messed up if I preach this. You want me to say what? You want me to preach Ezekiel? You want me to preach on rebellion? He's looking at the scrolls. They were covered with funeral songs and words of sorrow and pronouncements of doom. Who wants to preach that? If you want to preach it, you're weird. You get excited about the wrong things. I get to preach about doom today. I heard Bishop McLaughlin say one time, if I'm going to preach about hell, i got to preach it with tears in my eyes. Because it's a message that hurts, that stings, but you don't want people to go. It's nothing exciting and thrilling. We have the heart of a shepherd about preaching about doom and sorrow and funeral songs. But this is what the Lord said to Ezekiel. It jumps to chapter 3, verse 1. The voice said to me, son of man, eat what I am giving you. Eat the scroll. He said, take that scroll with the funeral songs and the words of sorrow and the pronouncements of doom, fold it up, and eat it. Eat it and digest it. Eat this scroll. Take this word which you don't like, and you eat it, and you digest it, and you give this message to my people. So I opened my mouth, and he fed me the scroll. And he said, fill your stomach with this, he said. And when I ate it, it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. In other words, sometimes God gives a hard word. And if he gives it, you still have to eat it until it becomes sweet. Starts off bitter. But as you digest it, as you align yourself with the will of God, you know that it's right. And you know it's got an effect that it's got to accomplish. Can I share a secret with you about good preaching? The word hits us first before it hits you. The word convicts us first before it convicts you. The word challenges us before it challenges you. An obedient pastor must take the word, eat it, digest it, then deliver it. 
When I met my wife, she ate things that I promised I would never eat. <laughs> I got to Yale, and I didn't know what kale <laughs> was. <laughs> Rabbit food, that's what I called it. But I grew a taste for it. One day I was on this tip and said, okay, we're going to start eating. We're going to get rid of grains and um, we're going to get us some Ezekiel bread. <laughs> Woo! They knew what they were doing when they called it Ezekiel bread. And I remember one time we got this cereal. It was called Ezekiel cereal. My wife tasted it first, and I watched her. <laughs> she took a spoonful of it, she ate it, she said, <laughs> Yo, she said, this tastes like punishment. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! But it was filled with protein and bunch of stuff that we probably needed in our body. <laughs> I'm like, if she can't eat it, I surely can't. <laughs> Sometimes the things that are best for you are the hardest things to swallow. But when you love truth in the innermost parts, it might be tough going down, but you're, you're thinking about the results. You're thinking about the glory that God's going to get. And somehow, that difficult to digest word, it's bitter at first, but because of your love for the Lord, it becomes honey, life-giving, sustaining, because there's no better place to be than in the well of the Lord. When preaching is unpopular, when living for God is unpopular. When doing the right thing with everybody on your job, stealing, cheating, talking to somebody, and you feel that pressure, and you or somebody's on the fence right now, do I do the right thing? Do I just do as the Romans do? And God is saying, when living right is unpopular, you live right and let the chips fall where they may. But God's going to take care of you. As you stand, I want to leave you with this final moment. We're just going to pray for a moment. Worship for just a moment. Worship team, if you can come up. An obedient pastor must take the word, eat it, digest it, and deliver it. A submitted people receives the word and the spirit in which it was given. They don't reject when your heart is soft towards the Lord. You don't reject. You receive. And it might be like some Ezekiel bread cereal. You might little, you need a little extra water to digest this. You might need a little extra worship to wash it down. But you got to get what it's trying to give you. Because God is equipping us for the times that we live in. The world we live in is spiraling into decay. The world system has confused the minds of non-believers and believers alike. And as much as we don't want to hear it, this is a message of warning. That we as the church cannot fall asleep in this culture. The society that we live in is not your friend. Yes, we love the people in the world, but we cannot love this world system. We must recognize it for what it is, and we must get Holy Spirit-inspired instructions as to how we navigate this thing called life as we know it. This is a time where God is calling his church. He is convening the body of Christ back to their local assemblies. This is an hour where he is authorizing and verifying apostolic leadership after his heart. 
There still are genuine pastors who have not bowed down to Baal. There's still five-fold ministry of people who have been duly ordained, consecrated to operate in the offices that they have. There's still churches that preach the gospel that are biblical in their expression and their belief, and they are doing the work that they have been called to their communities to do. But we also have to recognize that there are false teachers in the earth. And that the spirit of Antichrist, which aims to usurp the authority of Christ, will sometimes raise itself up in people who have platforms and they have the wrong type of power and they have earthly wisdom rather than heavenly wisdom. So God is blowing the trumpet for those who call themselves believers and say that you have to make a distinct pivot in this culture. You cannot be neutral. Your neutrality will get you chewed up and spitting out. First, by the world that you're trying to reach, and secondly, by the Savior who says, I knew you not because you were lukewarm. You refused to be hot or cold. Thus nullifying any effect that you would have in the earth. You cannot straddle the fence in this hour. You have to stand on truth with love. Love is not the opposite of truth. They walk hand in hand together. And when you love God and love people, you say what God calls you to say with all patience and long suffering because you want people to receive the truth. Many will reject, but they are still a few who are waiting in the wings, looking for someone to be an Ezekiel in their life. Somebody has a little nephew, a cousin, a family member, and you are the Ezekiel of your family. There's someone on somebody's job in the marketplace. You are the Ezekiel on your floor. You're the Ezekiel in your neighborhood. You're the Ezekiel in your school amongst the administrators that you're responsible for, working with. And your obedience to take God's word and to swallow it and to say what he's called you to say and to do what he's called you to do in the context in which he placed you is the difference between someone coming to know Jesus for real. Don't focus on those who will reject him. Focus on those who will receive him. So for every 20, 30 people who reject the message, there's one, there's two, there's three who will be grateful that you are willing to be honest and true. And the three that receive the message will bear much fruit in the kingdom of God because all he needs is a seed and that seed will produce much fruit. This is an hour where God is still anointing and authenticating his servants and his princes in the church. That although influence culture will set up and raise up people who call themselves ministers, who call themselves internet pastors, who call themselves prophets, they have not been sent by the Lord. But God is still establishing his reign and his rule and his local church. He is raising up people who have the heart of the Lord and who've been commissioned to communities and anointed to be effective in this society. And watch this. God will raise up people to go into the marketplace and, yes, into social media. Yes, into these places of influence. But they will be submitted to the orthodoxy of the word. They will have covering. They will have community. They will have connection. And they will be sober-minded and vigilant to understand that they are on assignment. They will be driven by assignment and not algorithm. They will hold the verification of the Holy Spirit in higher esteem than they hold the verification of Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. The check means nothing apart from the Holy Spirit. So, Father, would you raise up a people who are not seeking popularity, but who are totally and completely sufficient in you. You see their needs. You know who they are. You've got plans for them, and oh, you have a crown, and you have a reward for everyone that does what you tell them to do in the earth. And that's what motivates us. We disconnect ourselves with the addiction of dopamine, of lights, right now in the name of Jesus. Father, if we are so driven by the approval of people in the virtual world and in the real world, what we're just doing and serving a ministry because someone can respond and say something to us, Father, would you deliver us from that right now? 
We're not driven by dopamine. We are driven by your word and your Holy Spirit. And we will do what you tell us to do. Say what you tell us to say. Father, as we worship, help us to wash this word down. And by the time this worship moment is done, somebody would have fully swallowed it and digested it. And in that moment of glory, they'll know what to do. Next steps, you're giving directions right now. You're correcting, you're reprimanding, but you're correcting and guiding people and exhorting them to a different action. Father, would you translate this word to help people apply it in their life? In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.